from the land of storytellers, this is the story of the land itself and of the peoples who've shaped it. It's majestic, it's thrilling, it's a story that tells us who we are, where we've come from and where we're going. It's a tale that's been 30,000 years in the making. It shows our country in ways we've never seen it before. From the Ice Age to the Information Age, this is our story, the story of Wales. To begin at the beginning, we need to come here, to the western end of the Gower Peninsula. And we need to take a walk along the cliff top. We're following a path taken by a geologist back in 1823. William Buckland scrambles down to a cave you can only get to at low tide. Inside, he finds the bones of a single human being, stained by a red tint. He thinks they may be those of a Roman prostitute. And he gives her a name, a name that sticks, the Red Lady of Paviland. But the real tale is a little different, and it starts 30,000 years ago. Our story begins in a time when these cliffs are a ridge above a river plain, and the sea is more than 50 miles away. The earliest truly human occupants of the land we know as Wales are burying one of their dead. With the body, they place ivory rods that they've carved from the tusks of mammoths and other treasures that will lie undisturbed until Buckland finds them 30,000 years later. A mammoth skull and a necklace of seashells. But the person they're laying to rest isn't a woman, as Buckland thought. He's a young man in his 20s. His is the earliest known human burial in Western Europe. The loss of a single human life counts for something even back then. The Red Lady of Paviland does seem very distant from the story of Wales and the Welsh as we've come to know it. And yet the way we think of that single life and death can set the tone for the whole of our history of Wales. One version of our past would see these people as sad and isolated in a dark space of their own. But I'm determined to remind us that they're much more connected than that sharing a whole way of life with others across an entire continent. That's how they know that this special pigment, red ochre, will stain the bones of the dead. And that's how they know that this is the way to honor the dead, burying them with beautiful things they've made. These people are tough. Soon they'll be facing the challenge of huge climate change. Surrounded by mammoths and rhinos, hyenas and lions, these Stone Age hunters know how to fight to survive. So as we trace our ascent from cave dweller to modern citizen, I want us to keep in mind that Wales has always been home to people who take their chances at the cutting edge of change. People who are open to new ideas and find ways to move forward without forgetting to honour those 
who've gone before. The story of Wales is the experience of each and every one of us in Wales, of anyone who's ever lived in this country, from the Red Lady of Paviland, buried in this cave on the Gower Peninsula tens of thousands of years ago, to you and me today. We are all part of the story of Wales. The climate changes. People are driven away from Paviland and everywhere else in Wales. A wall of ice 40 metres thick comes as far south as the Gower. For thousands of years, the whole of Britain is deserted. Eventually, the melting ice begins to shape the coastline we know today. The great thaw brings back plants and animals. People follow slowly. The trees grow, an ancient forest stretching across much of what we know as Wales. There are just a few gaps in the woodland where the deer eat out glades or people set fires to make clearings. About 6,000 years ago, agriculture reaches Western Britain. The farmers begin to clear parts of the forest to grow primitive wheat and to keep sheep and goats, cattle, pigs and dogs. Gradually, over the course of a 1,000 years, the people who live on this land, the land we call ours today, start to adapt. They start to cut through this vast natural forest and start to tackle the challenges of the world around them. This is the age of the great religious monuments like Pentre Ivan in Pembrokeshire. They bear witness to cults of the dead and fertility rituals. These people are farming and thinking about the meaning of their lives. Bryn Cellu Ddi on Anglesey. The tombs, passage and chamber are perfectly aligned to receive the first rays of the midsummer sun. So these are people who understand the changing seasons and the spinning earth they live on. And we know because of the distinctive way that they decorate this monument that they're trading goods and ideas with communities as far away as Orkney and Portugal. The people who inhabit this land are making some big statements. Here in Wales, we've discovered the largest timber construction anywhere in Europe from that age. Thousands of trees are cut down in order to build it. And it tells us that these are people with complex needs. People who want to make their mark on the world. The Hindwell enclosure is long gone, but from the post holes left behind in the soil, we can imagine how it dominates the Stone Age landscape. It covers almost the whole valley floor. You could fit the Millennium Stadium inside eight times over. The wooden posts, more than 1,400 of them, stand six metres tall. and it's all built with stone and wood tools. There are other signs of ancient human settlement all over the Walton Basin, but it's the enclosure which sends a message far and wide. Here are people who've organized themselves on an epic scale.
The enclosure isn't a defensive wall, and a space this big isn't for penning animals. Experts believe it's used for feasts and celebrations. A hundred generations later, you can still see the curved footprint of its perimeter, determining the path of this country road as it crosses the basin. Just a few centuries after the building of the Walton Basin enclosure, the world changes. Humanity emerges from the Stone Age. These days, this is what Llandidno is all about. It's about relaxation and enjoyment. And this great tramway, which takes us all the way up the Great Orm, tells us so much about the Victorian heyday. Llandidno is all about leisure. This is where people come to escape the grime of heavy industry. And what a contrast to the world of 4,000 years ago, when the heavy industry is right here, underneath this mountain. There's a revolution going on. I'm talking about metal, and the Great Orm is where it's happening. The Orm, Penagogarth in Welsh, is still one of the great vantage points on the North Wales coast. But what lies under my feet is even more impressive than the view. And that is saying something. Because under here, we have something that is world changing. It is copper. Now, copper is a very beautiful, very valuable metal. But it's not very hard working. It's quite soft. And here's the magical part. If you mix copper with tin, you end up with something that is harder and much more useful. And that is bronze. Less than 30 years ago, we knew nothing about the copper mines of the Great Orm and their place in the great leap forward of the Bronze Age. They were discovered by chance when a new car park was being excavated. Sean James began work as a tour guide here and found the mines so fascinating that she's gone on to make a full study of them as an academic archaeologist. Wow. That's quite breathtaking. What are we looking at? We're in one of the large chambers, and this used to be full of malachite, of copper ore, that the miners were digging out. Digging it out with little tools, little implements? Bone tools, stone hammers. Nothing really more sophisticated than that. About 30,000 animal bones have been discovered from the mine. It's a huge number. It is. Originally, these were all thought to be food waste, probably by the miners but I'm not sure you'd actually want to be eating down here. Oh. My research over the past few years suggests that these are all linked in with the mining itself. I'm sure people will be interested in what exactly they're digging out because I know that we've got an example here. Yeah. Just tell us what we've got here. This is malachite, this is the main copper ore. People think of copper today as this lovely orange metal, but this is how they'd have probably first seen it. If you smelt it with charcoal, 1,000 degrees centigrade, and suddenly you get this wonderful orange metal. So you've got five miles of tunnels. What does this represent worldwide? This is the largest prehistoric copper mine anywhere in the world. And we've probably only discovered about 10% of it so far. You see some of the little tunnels going off, which are terrifyingly small. Yeah. What kind of working conditions would there have been? Are people in there digging? I think possibly children are in some of those areas. We're talking maybe five or six-year-olds. It's just surprises everywhere you look. Yeah, including this area. One of the most exciting things, Sean, is to think that this place was making a product which wasn't for sale locally. It was going much further afield. Enough copper came out of here to make about 10 million axes. Uh, so we're not talking domestic trade. This is meeting some sort of demand, maybe internationally. We're saying that Llandidno copper was being exported and used as weapons thousands of miles away. Yes. 
4,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago. <laughs> but that is an eye-opener. It is. The industrial scale of the Great Orm Enterprise demands a really sophisticated support network to feed the workforce, to smelt the copper, and to ship out the end product. By contrast, the basic tools of the trade are ingenious, but very simple. This is what? Uh, this is a stone hammer that they've just gone down to the beach, picked up a suitable stone, brought it up here, ready for digging with. You know, that's a very basic kind of tool, isn't it? Really? Simple, but very effective. You've got something there which is a little more delicate. It is more delicate, but still very effective. Uh, these are two cattle bones that we found from the mine. They're both tools. This one's a rib bone, rounded on the end, and uh, it would have been used for sort of chiselling out, digging out the malachite. Mm -hmm. And then this one is a humerus bone, so that's the front leg, and that is the perfect shape for just holding and digging out. A handle. Chiselling out the malachite. Yeah. Well, no, that, that chopping action you've done brings me to this, because this, for me, is the most surprising thing of all. You think mm. of three and a half thousand years ago, and there's a level of sophistication here which I have to say took me by surprise. So mm. talk us through this. Yeah, this is one of the uh, pulse stave axes that they would have used in the Bronze Age. Would have been made in a, a two-piece mould. Uh, but this is bronze, so this is the copper, which would have come from here, and then tin, which they'd have to go to Cornwall probably to get. That's something that was held three and a half thousand years ago. Yeah. That's quite a thrill. It is. Just one look at this ancient gold cape will tell you how much industrial wealth is being generated here. Discovered in Flintshire in the 1830s and beaten out of a single gold ingot, the mould cape is an astonishing piece of workmanship fit to adorn the slender shoulders of a queen. It dates from a time when Egypt is building the pyramids. North Wales has riches to rival the pharaohs. People here are exchanging goods and ideas with mainland Europe. But who exactly are their trading partners? And how do they reach them? The latest research points west to the open Atlantic. This is the trading superhighway of the ancient world. Through it, we may be able to trace our Celtic roots much further back than we ever imagined. And one of the pioneers of this new line of thinking is Professor John Cock. John, it's an intriguing thought, as we look at the sea here today on the coast of North Wales, to think that this channel, this transport by sea, which, frankly, lots of people would never have imagined, was more sophisticated, more advanced than we ever, ever thought. It was probably easier to get around by sea than it was over land. The land was heavily forested. Before the Romans who were here, there weren't good roads. It was probably easier to maintain and create long-distance connections uh, by sea. As soon as metals come into the picture, and particularly copper and bronze most especially, you need the long-distance connections just to keep the new economy going. You're saying we should think of Wales in a much bigger world. That's right. It's always, certainly it's always been connected to the rest of Britain, but there's another side to it, and we're looking at that other side of it now. It's the Western Ocean, if John is right, which links Wales to the Celtic world of the continent. And it's not the story we used to be told. The idea of hostile forces sweeping in from the east in a series of sudden invasions from the continent, well, that idea is wrong. For Professor Cock, the links have always been to do with trade, not invasion. They go way, way back in time and all the way down the Atlantic seaboard. His evidence points to Celts from the West. It's a major change of perspective 
for those of us who grew up with a history that talks about Wales and its eastern neighbours. And it's, there's something very exciting about the, 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 the way we're telling the story now, John, which is that it is an outward-looking Wales we're talking about all those years ago. No, it's a very different perspective now. You now have evidence for a diversity of very ancient Celtic languages on the continent of Europe. All of this new evidence is constantly churning up new connections with the Welsh language, names of people, names of gods, and so on, so that there has always been this long-distance maritime connection. And this goes right back through the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, Copper Age, right on back as far as you want to go for human beings being here. The trading links go deep into history, but the technology is moving forward. There's a big change coming, and we can understand a lot more about it because of a chance discovery a century ago. 100 years ago, workmen were here at the foot of Craigathlin Rigos, creating a reservoir for the people of Rhonda, just over the hill. And in the course of clearing peat and vegetation, they made the most fantastic of discoveries. What they'd found was a hoard of weapons and tools from the late Bronze Age. Two bronze cauldrons, so big that you can't get your arms around them. Carpenter's tools, chisels and gouges, and some of the finest decorative horse gear ever found in Britain. But there's something else too, an iron sword, probably made in eastern France. This superbly grooved, it's just part of a sword, the grooves on the blade telling us that hmm, this isn't just a first-time blacksmith's effort with iron because 2,700 years ago, 2,800 years ago, iron was something really new. New and valuable. Too valuable to have been left here without thought. From similar finds in bogs and rivers and lakes, Experts believe they're offerings to a local goddess. But how do these gifts to the waters come to be here in Wales in the first place? Are they evidence of trade or war? Perhaps 50 years ago, an archaeologist looking at this Llinfawr collection might say that uh, the foreign sword uh, from the continent meant that an invader carried it here. By today, many of us believe it was trade, gifts passing through many hands. Most intriguing of all, there's evidence here in the L-shaped iron sickle and the short spearhead that local smiths are transferring their skills in bronze to work in this even more useful new metal. Here is our bronze smith somehow being introduced or experimenting with iron ores that you can find in the geology, in the rocks behind us here of the South Wales coalfield. Experimenting with smelting, forging the iron and creating new metal objects in the old style. We're heralding, we're in the cradle of native iron working, not just in Wales because these are the oldest native-made iron objects in the whole of the British Isles and Ireland. Fantastic story. The Llyn Peninsula in the northwest corner of Wales is another location that opens our eyes to the nature of life here in this new age of iron. 
in the centuries before the Romans arrive, the population of Wales may have been around 80,000. There are no towns, but there are hill forts, more than a thousand of them. Just think, this entrance has been here for 2,000 years and it still tells us a story. We may be on top of an exposed peak 450 metres above the sea, but this is a major Iron Age settlement. Treir Cairi is one of the best preserved and most densely occupied hill forts in Britain. Behind its ramparts, you can still see the shapes of more than 150 stone houses. But hill fort is a misleading term. The people of Treir Cairi are farmers, not fighters, and from their homes they can look down on the fertile land below. So what does this mesmerizing place tell us? It tells us that long before the Romans arrived, there was a sophisticated society here, trading not just in a local area, but much further afield. And don't be fooled, it may look as if it's been built to withstand an invasion from a distant enemy, not the case. It's all about local power and local control. So by 2,000 years ago, a pattern has emerged. The ancient peoples of Wales have settled into a group of separate tribes. From what's about to happen to them, we can distinguish their characteristics and even give them names. The fierce Silures in the southeast, the Ordoviches, led by the Druids of Anglesey in the north. Each tribe is many thousands strong with its own royal family and priests and rituals. They squabble and they skirmish, but they speak a common language and they know each other's customs and gods. This is their home. Forty three AD, they're confronted by the most efficient killing machine in the world. The Roman army sweeps across Britain. Many tribes surrender without a fight. Others try guerrilla tactics to ambush and surprise the invaders. Across the Menai Straits, inspired by the Druids, the Ordoviches put up some of the strongest resistance. In the south, the Silures take the battle to the Romans. This land, rolling down towards the Severn estuary, is the power base of the Silures, and power is the right word. They're strong, they're fierce, they're not the kind of fighters who hide in the hills and launch the odd raid. They're in the business of making full frontal attacks on the Romans. According to one story, they demolish three Roman units in a single day. And then they follow that success by almost wiping out an entire legion. Roman generals come to hate them. They swear to sweep the Silures off the face of the earth. But that's not so easy, particularly when the Silures are joined by one of ancient Britain's most skillful warlords. His name is Caractacus, or Caradog as he's known in Welsh. It takes an epic struggle to capture him, but he's such a catch that he's sent for trial to the emperor himself. When he gets to Rome, Caradog is condemned to death, but for some reason, the Emperor Claudius allows him one final plea for his life. And the Roman historian Tacitus 
sets down the words of that plea. What we have is the first speech in history credited to someone who's lived in Wales. It's quite a speech. Noble Emperor and people of Rome, I face humiliation while you have glory. I had horses, men, weapons. Are you surprised I'm sorry to have lost them? Just because you want to rule the world, do you think everyone else is happy to be made a slave? If I had surrendered without a fight, no one would have heard of my downfall or your triumph. If you kill me, they will both be forgotten. But if you spare me, I shall stand forever as a symbol of your mercy. The words work. Caractacus is freed, but he never returns to Britain, and history records no more of him. What we can say is that the ancient Britons are a bit of a handful, to put it mildly, and that's certainly the case here in Wales. We're at the very edge of the Roman Empire, and Rome realises that it needs a very powerful military presence if it's to keep things under control. So what do the Romans decide that they have to do? Well, they decide to build an immense fortress here at Caerleon, and they call this place Isca. This is where thousands of soldiers are fed and watered, housed and trained. Trained to put the locals down and keep them down. Thirty years after the Romans invade, this amphitheatre is where a whole Roman legion is entertained as well as put through its paces. But Isca, it turns out, isn't just a big army camp. Whilst we've been filming this series, archaeologists have been digging here on a large area between the military site and the River Usk. Their extraordinary new findings give us a completely fresh understanding of this place. Caerleon is a Roman city and a major port. What we can see here is a, uh, a new reconstruction that we've had um, done. It's still in the development stage, but it shows what this part of Killian might have been like at the end of the first century AD, as we imagine it, around about 100. You can see a river ship coming up the um, Usk from the Severn Estuary, bringing men and materials into Killian. Here we have the quayside, which we've been excavating here. Um, where all the materials and the men would have been offloaded. And then we have a fly-through of the uh, Roman buildings that we've been uncovering, including the very large courtyard complex, a series of buildings that we think are the marketplaces that include bathhouses. Here we can see the amphitheatre. And then we fly through the fortress's west gate into the centre of Isca, where we can see barrack blocks and store buildings, the commanding officer's house and headquarters, and Killian's famous bathhouse, where the Romans would have kept themselves clean. And then we're flying through the main street, out towards the civilian settlement on the other side. And it really gives a, a tremendous sense of how big some of these buildings were and how imposing and important they must have looked at the time. One of the new riverfront structures discovered by Dr Guest is more than 100 metres long and 100 metres wide, big enough to fit the amphitheatre inside its central courtyard. It's just part of this port complex which is changing our view of how Caerleon connects Britain to the rest of the Roman Empire. We're in one of the excavation trenches that's closest to the River Usk, and in this trench we think we have the remains of the Roman port. Here, this wall, we think, is the quayside wall that the Romans would have constructed outside the fortress at Caelian, um, which would have allowed ships and boats to moor on the River Usk and for men and materials and other goods to be offloaded and then taken into the fortress and into the other parts of Roman Wales. One of the things the Romans brought 
to Britain nearly 2,000 years ago was the use of writing. This is a Roman brick that you can see here, which has a stamp on it, um, which records the fact that this tile was made by the Second Augustan Legion. And this is a particularly special find that it has parts of three letters on it, an A, you can see the crossbar of the A there, a V or a U, and then what is either a C or a G. Roman inscriptions, um, particularly imperial inscriptions, often record the uh, imperial titles of the emperor, one of which was um, Augustus. The Romans were very keen to make sure that you knew, as you came to a place like this, that it was now part of the new civilised world and that the people who had done the civilising were the soldiers, were the Second Augustan Legion, but they were doing it in the name of the emperor and presumably, if we're lucky, we may well find more of this inscription um, which might tell us which emperor that was. So the discoveries made by Dr Guest and his team allow us to see Carleon in a much, much broader way than we've ever done before. It's the first and only time that we in Britain became part of a Mediterranean world. Carleon was a major access route so the wine that Romans liked to drink, or the olive oil that they liked to put on their food, for example, came in amphorae in large storage vessels. And it's not just the material things, but also the new gods that Romans brought with them, the new languages, the new ways of dressing and thinking about the world. These would also have been brought into Western Britain, presumably at places like this. So we now have a better idea of the true scale and purpose of Isca. The Romans clearly want Caerleon to be a major city, a great city, an integral part of the empire. And they want all the benefits of Roman civilization to apply right here in this new province of theirs. So what we're talking about now is not just a military battle, it's also a battle for hearts and minds. Just down the road from Caerleon, at the door of this church in Caerwent, is a relic of Roman times which shows just how quickly the native Britons embrace all that Rome has to offer. It's a stone tablet with a Latin inscription, a kind of operating license for Civitas Silurum, the self-governing council of the Silures. The Romans have built a whole new town for the tribe themselves to rule and govern. Just a generation after fighting to the death to defend their land, the Silures have accepted Roman rule and agreed to pay their taxes. In return, they're enjoying all the benefits of Roman civilization. They even get their own assembly building. You could say it's the first time devolution comes to Wales. And it's not just in the south that the Romans secure their grip. The mountains are no barrier to them. They build a whole network of roads, military camps and towns stretching from Caerleon and Caerwent to Carmarthen in the west and Carnarvon in the north. The Roman occupation of Britain is a massive enterprise it ties up the empire's military resources and personnel for decades. Just imagine the logistics involved in building and maintaining this one fort, Sigontium, in Carnarvon, at the end of the Roman supply chain. So why do the Romans come here and stay here? One reason is prestige. Conquering Britannia brings the Emperor Claudius a lot of glory. It tightens his grip on power and never discount the importance of PR in the politics of ancient Rome. But there are good practical reasons to be here too. This island is a breadbasket and Rome can tax its farmers and enjoy the fruits of their labour on the land. 
And then there's the most valuable resource of all, people. While some Britons enjoy all of the benefits of Roman civilization, many more of them are traded as slaves. Or living tools, as the Romans call them. And they're put to dig out Britannia's mineral wealth, like the gold at Dolly Coffee in West Wales. Many other slaves are shipped off to Rome to serve its politicians, philosophers and army veterans. Life for many is nasty, short and brutal. But others do thrive on Rome's bounty. Any Welsh speaker will confirm just how comprehensively the tribes of Wales adopt the benefits of Roman civilization. The language proves it. Some of the words used here at Segontium 2,000 years ago are still being used on the streets of Carnarvon today. Pont for bridge, fenest for window. These are Latin words which now form some of the nuts and bolts of the Welsh language. And there's something else that Rome leaves behind here, Christianity. At first, the Romans persecute the new faith, but then they embrace it. In the year 306, when he's on a military campaign in Britain, Constantine the Great is proclaimed emperor. He is the first Christian to rule Rome. The Romans rule Britannia for 350 years. There are imperial soldiers here right up to the year 400. But in the end, with their empire under threat, the Romans march out of our history and leave Christian Britain to defend itself. Towns are abandoned. Those living in the ruins of empire have to deal as best they can with new threats, Irish pirates and Saxon invaders. David and Brecheniog are overrun by the Irish. Gwynedd is invaded, probably by tribes, from north of Hadrian's Wall. And then come the Angles and the Saxons. From the year 400, these Germanic peoples push eastwards from the continent, smothering the old Celtic and Roman culture in lowland Britain, forcing it back into the hills and the mountains of the west. The Anglo-Saxons don't share the Christian faith that Rome has brought, and it seems that Britain's Roman legacy may be eclipsed completely. These are mysterious times, filled with battles against the odds. Something in them sparks the Celtic imagination. The hard facts are scarce, but the struggle to keep the faith alive inspires some of the greatest stories of Wales. There is a world of difference between history and legend. But when you come to a magical place like this, Deep in the heart of the Welsh countryside, they seem to come together. In this land of mystic waters and sacred springs, it's a time for tales of heroes whose exploits have cast spells on the world ever since. I'm thinking especially of King Arthur, the great defender of Christian Britain, and of course, of his resident magician, the mighty Merlin. In one story, written down more than a thousand years ago by a Welsh monk known as Nennius, it is Merlin who predicts that the Red Dragon, the native Britons, will eventually defeat the White Dragon, the invading Anglo-Saxons. These are tales of conflict and heroism. They set up the notion that this land is embattled, 
ringed around by dark forces. And legend has it that Arthur and his warriors are still waiting somewhere in the deepest countryside, ready to come to our rescue. The fact is that the Arthur industry, if I can call it that, built around Camelot, the sword in the stone, the knights of the round table, all of this is invented at a much later time. But these inventions are based on some intriguing fragments of historical evidence. In one account of a great battle with the Anglo-Saxons said to take place in the year 516, Arthur carries the Christian cross on his shoulders for three days and nights before leading the Britons to victory. All over Britain, there is an epic struggle going on. And because the Celts, from Cornwall in the south to central Scotland in the north, speak a language that's an early form of Welsh, we can still get a sense of the drama and turmoil if we know where to look. This is the Book of Aneirin in the National Library in Aberystwyth, and it contains the record of a battle from around the year 600. Gwyr aeth gatraeth oedd ffraith eu llu, glasfedd eu hanquin, a Gwenwyn V. The men who marched to Catterick were a swift war band. Their drink was mead. It proved to be poison. They're very famous lines. They're taken from the earliest surviving Welsh poem, written by a poet living in Edinburgh. And what's striking is that it is still possible for a Welsh speaker to get the gist. It tells the story of an army of soldiers going into battle against the Angles in the north of England. And what we get in all of these stories is a gradual recognition of our identity as a people. We are the Cymru, the compatriots, the Brythoniaid, the Britons, the Waelas, the Welsh. That's the Anglo-Saxon word for strangers, or more precisely, those strangers who used to live in a Roman world. Part of Rome's great legacy is Christianity, but now Wales produces its own Christian leaders. They're determined to make the faith on these shores more rooted and much more outward looking. Between the years 400 and 600, they managed to defend and strengthen Christianity in the teeth of Anglo-Saxon aggression. This is the Age of the Saints. Some focus completely on the spiritual life, away from the turmoil of war that's all around. It's a search for remoteness and isolation, for the kind of spiritual peace that can still be found along parts of the Welsh coastline. These are people who want to withdraw from the world and who take as their example the Christian hermits of the Middle East, thousands of miles away. We're on the edge of Europe here, but we are in the mainstream of Christianity. Other saints chose a different path, engaging with the lives of ordinary people around them. They build communities which shelter the faith in the troubled times of Anglo-Saxon attack. The most important is the settlement at Llanilltid Vawr, Llantwit Major. As Dr Juliet Wood explains to me, this is where a remarkable man called Illtid turns his back on a soldier's life and builds what we believe to be Britain's first ever centre of learning.
We don't have a lot of written records from this period, but we do have the saints' lives and we do have stories about mythical figures. Now, these are always sort of done much after the historical period. You kind of have to be careful with them, but they do tell us what was important to the culture. And certainly with the Ilted stories, you're getting this image of a powerful saint, a saint who taught other saints, a saint who carried forward this notion of the Christian message. Um, Ilted starts out as a warrior rather than a, rather than a monk. He was raised as a Christian. He's not a pagan. He was raised as a Christian, but he decided he was going to be a warrior. And then he becomes converted to the monastic life. The church of St. Ifdid dates from long after the original monastery. But it's built on the tradition that Ifdid set up a powerhouse of learning, producing a thousand graduates. Some sources claim that both St. David of Wales and St. Patrick of Ireland are pupils of Ifdid. The Celtic crosses at the church door date back almost as far as the age of the saints. One of them bears the name of Ilted himself and several of his chief followers. They are men who cling to faith and learning in a time of war. Prayer and study are their weapons, but the violent times they live in mark them with a steely determination to fight for the faith. The Welsh saints are a quite different bunch. Uh, there are no martyrs, they're quite tetchy. Um, they really blast their enemies. Uh, they're very strong figures. So you get these wonderful legends which tell you what it is about a Welsh saint that we ought to emulate. Ilted's focus is on the world outside. In church terms, Llantwit Major is what we call a class monastery. That's a flexible settlement linked to the local chieftains who are also determined to defend their patch. It was a time when Wales was beginning to think of itself as different. But it wouldn't have been um, all of Wales in the sense that we now think of this. So when we think of the story of Wales, you're really dealing with a mosaic which is eventually going to come together. And Ilted himself taught a number of very important Welsh saints. And they went out and they founded their own class monasteries. The mosaic of Welsh life isn't yet complete, but the picture is filling out. In the 500s and 600s, Ilted's disciples build small communities all over Wales. The physical evidence of their existence is long gone. But the religious enclosures, the timber churches, the small buildings, the cemeteries, all inside a protective wall, they've certainly left their mark in every part of Wales. If you want to find lasting traces of the early Welsh church, just look at a map, because the old Welsh word for enclosure is llan, and there are hundreds of Welsh place names which combine the word llan with the name of a saint. We've already been to Llandidno, the llan of St Tidno. There's Llan Badarn, the llan of St Padarn. There's Llanelli, of course the Llan of St. Ethley. There are slightly more complex ones. Llan Trisant, the Llan of Three Saints. Llan Pym Saint, the Llan of Five Saints. And then, of course, there's the most exotic one of them all, the one that talks about St. Mary and St. Tisilio, and lots of other things too. And yes, I can say it. Llan Vair Pwll Gwyngyll Go Gera Chwyrn Drobo Llan Tisilio Go Go Goch. How's that? The Welsh saints certainly leave their mark in every corner of Wales, and they do more. Surrounded by Saxon enemies who don't share their faith, they manage to break out to inspire others. Their impact is immense. Crossing the Celtic seas, they nurture the Christian life of Ireland and Scotland, Cornwall and Brittany. The traditions they establish give us masterpieces, such as the illuminated manuscripts of faraway Lindisfarne.
But not all of these spiritual giants are travelers. The best known figure of the age stays at home here in Wales. And he builds a wooden church in this sheltered, tranquil spot in the far west on the coastline. Today, it is the site of this magnificent stone-built cathedral, which exudes power and certainty. It is, of course, the Cathedral Church of Dewi Sant, our patron saint, Saint David. Every schoolchild in Wales knows about the miracles of Saint David, how the ground suddenly rises under his feet so that a crowd in Llandewi Brevi can hear him preach. Though I have to say, it's a mystery to me why you'd need to create a hill in Ceredigion of all places. And then we learn that this gentle soul on his deathbed urges people to be faithful to the little things. It's a comforting image. It's a reassuring image. Saint David emerges as a bit of a softy. Don't believe a word of it. David's nickname was Aquaticus, the water man. People used to think this was because water was the only thing he'd drink. But experts now believe it's because he's given to testing his faith by standing for hours in ice-cold pools. We have very few facts about him, but the way we see Dewey is important because his name, his tradition, are part and parcel of a distinctive Welsh form of the Christian faith, one that tries to hold on to its independence for 500 years to come. And it's that tenacity, that determination, which earns Dewey his place as our patron saint and as a national figurehead. So people have learned to live and to thrive in this landscape. It's challenged them and they've left their mark on it. They innovate, they trade, they deal in objects of fabulous worth and beauty. They faced the armies of Rome and they've benefited from all that mighty empire has to offer. Now they're fighting for their place in the world and for the way they want to live. So the Welsh have arrived. They're a force to be reckoned with and the battle to strengthen and defend that identity is about to begin.